In this week's episode of Bandwidth Blog on Air, we answer your questions in our first ever Listener's Mail episode. Welcome back to Bandwidth Blog on Air. This is episode 9. Welcome to Bandwidth Blog on Air, the weekly podcast of bandwidthblog.com. We've received a lot of questions from our readers and we've selected the best ones both tech-related and not, to answer in this week's episode. We'd just like to sincerely thank you for all of your entries and questions so far. Uh, With regards to names, we hope we don't mispronounce any of them, and we look forward to going through them as they go down the list. Uh, If we do mispronounce your name, feel free to give us a phonetics demonstration in the comments below. Our first question up from Mr. Impor Moniela is, what would you recommend between the Huawei P8 and the Mate 7? Well, I'll take that one um, because I, I wrote the reviews for both of those phones. Um, and, and right at the beginning, I have to say that the P8 is a superior smartphone in almost every way. Uh, the Mate 7 has great build quality just uh, as the P8 does. But I do think that overall, the software experience, the performance, um, and the look and feel of the P8 is definitely superior. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Brian. I think, luckily for Huawei, um, they've definitely improved in great strides from the Mate 7 to the P8. Uh, and I think some of the better features that you're going to experience from the Mate 7 to the P8 is the upgraded lollipop os um, from kitkat which was on the mate 7 having used the p8 myself i think you're going to particularly enjoy the camera Um, i found that quite a joy to work with i think overall the p8 is quite actually a big step up from huawei compared to the the mate 7 and i'd throw my money behind that so talking about software we've got a question from david late and he asks what is the best way to stop your android device from lagging while still updating to the latest version of the os i think you'd probably get quite subjective answers from different people on this but my usual modus operandi if i'm going to update to the latest os is i would uh, allow the phone to update and then i would factory reset the device and start from the beginning and i would try clear out all the extra apps um, images media files on there to try and secure as much space for the operating system as possible Um, particularly i found with lollipop it's better to have that extra space in the beginning and rather let the os establish its caches and whatnot in the background on the other hand i realize the question is based on updating to the os but i've actually always been a person who's kept to a previous OS and rather kept the level of performance that I have grown to expect from my smartphone. My present uh, Sony Z1, which is my daily driver, I've not updated to Lollipop at all. I've actually left it on the last stable release of KitKat to try and secure the best experience I can get from it. But what are your thoughts, Dennis? Well, reviewing a lot of phones means that we don't really have a daily driver these days, but, but when I did, I also had the Xperia Z1. And I actually did upgrade it to the uh, Lollipop build, and when I did that, the phone completely died. So I think a lot has to be said about the stability of an Android build in the first place, and also how well the manufacturer actually skins that build um, and and how it performs on the device as you said um, it has to it has to be a good build um, especially on all the hardware to run properly so if i did have an older phone if it's more than a year old i would definitely say just hold off a little bit um, and see what other people say about the performance of the device uh, on the new version of the software that being said I'm um, the same way. I really do want to upgrade my phone as soon as I can because with every new build of Android, you'll have inherent new features that are only available on that build. So it is a bit of a difficult question to answer, but it would depend on how much you use your phone um, and how hard you push it because if you launch a lot of apps on a new build that isn't completely stable uh, you'll definitely have some problems Zubayir Noor asks us two things Um, Zubayir says that he's always off to a value for money phone especially when it comes to smartphones and what are our thoughts on the Inju Fire phone secondly would it be worthwhile to import the the OnePlus 2 into South Africa we also love finding great value for money in, in all kinds of tech but it it has to be said that you have to kind of be skeptical of something that seems too cheap that means it usually is uh, we haven't actually had the opportunity to use the inju um, we've we've uh, reached out to take a lot because they are the only people that carry the device in south africa um, unfortunately we haven't haven't been able to get the device in hand but what we have seen is th- that it, it it actually performs quite well for such a cheap device one of our tech colleagues um, on another site actually bought the device for herself um, and she used it for quite a while and she said that you know she was pleasantly surprised with a thousand five hundred rand smartphone, um, which I, which I think says a lot about where we are as com- consumers in South Africa. Obviously, we're off to the uh, cheapest prices possible, but I think most smartphone users 
don't want to buy a phone that is too cheap and doesn't perform at all. Uh, for your second question, to be honest with you, I don't really know if it's if it's worthwhile to import the OnePlus 2. Um, it's a great smartphone, and it definitely, if you were buying this um, as, an, as a consumer in another country, perhaps, it would offer really accessible, great features at a really great price point. But I think to import it to South Africa, you're looking at import tax uh, as well. You're not going to have the full uh, localized warranty and service if you need it. Um, where are in your shoes, I think I would probably look elsewhere. I would probably look at maybe the more central um, flagship devices that are offered by the likes of Vodacom and MTN um, because I think at the end of the day you're going to be paying an equivalent amount to get a OnePlus 2 as you would you know your premium Galaxy S6 um, so in that regard it's disappointing but as South African consumers we've been left in the dark I agree I think it's going to be very very expensive to get the device into the country uh, and obviously the exchange rate has gone to hell so that doesn't help other than the traditional options of the carriers um, someone like Orange has a lot of um, a lot of smartphones at great prices, and the, and actually there are phones on there that are exactly the same price as you would pay internationally um, internationally for the for the One Plus Two. Um, something that comes to mind immediately is something like the Moto X Play, um, which I think is a good device, and it started selling now in South Africa. Our next question up on the list: uh, Dean Sardinus asks us, "Do smartphones really benefit from having 4K screens? Isn't it overkill?" Uh, in my own humble opinion. Absolute overkill, yeah. uh, absolute murder. Um, I don't really foresee any need for a smartphone to have a 4K uh, screen now in 2015. Like I've said, uh, and actually in last week's episode of Bandwidth Blog on Air, I think we'll get to that stage in maybe five to ten years, depending on what screen and what content we have available for it. But presently, I think there's actually so little 4K content, especially here in South Africa, it wouldn't make it worthwhile to have that screen. And I think secondly, personally, if I were to use a 4K screen phone, I wouldn't want to trade off uh, all my battery life to power the screen. I'm, I'm actually quite happy with 1080p displays. I think that's where it should be at the moment. I think uh, Quad HD hasn't quite perfected itself and it hasn't quite maximized on, on the battery capabilities of current gen flagships. Where we go with 4K, we'll have to wait and see, but at the moment, I think no, absolute overkill. Just to jump in there, I, I completely agree that it's overkill um, and it's not only the issues that you raised, but I mean, why would you ever need so many pixels on a screen display that size I mean you, the, the human eye will never be able to discern that that many pixels um, so definitely the, the issues that you raise in terms of uh, battery life is a big one but also the processor has to push so many more pixels so I think it's going to going to affect the, the performance of your device as well which I don't think we really need at this stage uh, for our next question Moses and Swami asks us uh, how long have you guys been in this industry and where do you see ourselves going from here um, hopefully I'm going upwards thanks to you Moses I appreciate all your questions <laughs> um, well Moses I've been blogging since I was, I was about 14 I've had my own private website where I've always published my thoughts on tech and before I came to Bandwidth Blog earlier this year and I wrote for another site which will remain unnamed <laughs> um, and I've kind of always just been interested in tech It's um, I've always been interested in gadgets and, and technology around me and I think my interest in it really started I think in, in 2008 my parents gifted me um, one of the old, very first white series MacBooks uh, to sort of learn to do graphic design on. And that's how I became interested in tech and I took it from there. Um, and since then, I've, I've just been writing nonstop. I studied a journalism program at UCT. Tech is a brilliant uh, conjunction of both my interests and my passions. Um, where, like, where would I like to see myself going from here? Uh, only upwards. Um, one day I'd like to see myself editing and, and doing um, tech work full time. That's, that's really what I'd like to be. I'd like to be a content creator, something like if you watch Marquez Brown Lee um, on YouTube, that would be my dream job. Well, on my side, Moses, uh, very much like many other people in the industry, um, I kind of stumbled into it, not because um, I, I, I was never interested in, in, uh, in journalism, but I just never had the opportunity really to do it. Um, um, so I, I'm actually a uh, business analyst by trade, but I've always, just like Brian, I've always been really, really interested in tech. I was always that geeky guy that kind of knew what was going on in the tech industry and um, something fortuitous came along. I was able to transition that into something of a day-to-day day-to-day -day kind of working situation, which which I'm very, very thankful for. Well, as as I'm the editor of the website, um, you know, the, the, my day-to-day -day duties are a lot more operational um, and I love doing these kind of things that are a little bit offbeat and kind of, you know, a break of pace. 
place. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking to push the website as far as we can go. We're trying to become the place where South Africans go for their gadget news. That is our primary focus, and we like to kind of spin off some other things. But the website as a whole is really, really growing uh, because of our readership and uh, because of the value that our content creators are putting on the site. And we just like to, to make that more accessible to more people um, and, and just basically grow going forward. We've got a, another interesting question from Shaquille Mohammed, um, and he asks, please discuss uh, streaming devices and the best ones and the best methods to use them and how to get the best streaming device set up. Well, that's a very broad question, and, and I'll start answering it by just quickly talking about some of the streaming options there are, because there are, I mean, by this day and age, there's a hell of a lot. So we've got, um, in South Africa, we, we may not have that many yet, um, but there's a lot of options in terms of services. So you've got um, things like Netflix um, and Hulu, and we've got Showmax that's now launched in South Africa. Um, and, and you really have the pick of pick of the bunch. Um, it depends on how much you want to pay, how good your internet connection is, um, and what hardware you're running. Um, but I think you can discuss that in a little bit more detail, Brian. But um, from my side, I would definitely say that you know it would depend on your taste. Um, I really enjoy using Showmax. I'm, I'm giving it a test for a couple of months. Um, the content is a little bit limited at the moment, but I'm sure that'll that'll expand in time. Um, so it's a brand new service. But I have to give it to the guys because the streaming works really, really well. Um, it's very much like streaming YouTube in some ways because um, it can automatically detect how fast your, your internet connection is and it'll actually adjust the quality that it's streaming um, to, to actually fit your needs, which is great, um, especially from like a first gen kind of launch, launch product. There's also a lot of um, options in terms of hardware itself. So you've got um, something like Apple TV, which a lot of people use. Um, Obviously, just with a U.S. account, which is probably not completely legal, but hey, it works. And we've also got one um, from a local South African company, which is making some waves. But it, at the end of the day, it depends on what your budget is and what, how fast your internet is. I'd actually like to talk about my, my own home streaming setup, and I hope this can maybe give you a bit of clarity on what you'd like to do. But uh, I actually don't I don't subscribe to any streaming vendors. So I don't subscribe to, you know, to um, Netflix or Hulu, uh, or nor do I have an Apple TV I actually set up in my house um, my own Plex account, P-L-E-X, um, which is actually a streaming service which you can download and install on a dedicated computer in your house, and you'll be able to stream um, your own movies, music, uh, images, if wanted, um, to all your own devices. How I've got that set up is I've got a 4 megabit per second uh, ADSL connection, and to that I've got my home um, Mac desktop, which I work on, which I've got indexed through Plex. So I've got all my movies, my local movies, um, music, um, pictures, is podcasts stored on there which is stored sort of on a server which Plex actually will set up for you and then from there that's distributed to all my devices through the Plex um, app which is available on Android iOS and like a litany of other uh, platforms and from there I'm able at anywhere in my house through whichever device I'm using my tablet smartphone I can actually stream directly from um, my computer in my main room to wherever I am and I quite enjoy doing that for watching a good movie. At form on my TV, I have an Xbox One, and I've got that linked to the Plex app as well. So I can directly push um, a film or a song straight to my TV, and that I quite enjoy. And it's actually quite a painless thing to set up. If you just visit, uh, I think it's just Plex.tv, uh, P-L-E-X.tv, uh, you'll be able to download the client for your own computer. And then once you've bought the necessary apps on whatever uh extra device you want to watch on you should actually be good to go if you want to watch local content that you already have other options are of course these new pocket-sized pcs which everybody is everybody's starting to release and the one that made it a trend i would say was the raspberry pi um, and i've actually used that to set up this kind of um, home connection with streaming options and it's really really easy to do and that's that's definitely an option for a lot of people Carl Millwood asks us an interesting question. Um, do we see the trend in thin phones vanishing? 
Um, now, this is something I actually speak a lot about to the people I meet who ask me about smartphones and tech and assorted, and I don't see the trend in, in relative thinness going anywhere. I think that's going to be the space race to come is going to be um, screen size and relative device size, um, thinness in the bezels. But like I say, I've always said to the people I talk to, I don't necessarily want a thin phone. I want the phone that works. Um, my daily driver, the Xperia Z1 smartphone, it's, it's actually pretty thick. It's probably about 0.7 centimeters and it does exactly what I need to do. And that for me is an ideal size because it fits comfortably in my hand. I know it's in my pocket when I put it there just because of its, its relative weight and size. Um, and I'm really comfortable with it. I wouldn't mind if manufacturers continue to make phones at that size that have got increasingly more and more powerful. But, you know, like I say, there's always the space race of manufacturers thinking, hey, we can do much more with much less. And I actually think, you know, that's, that's a bit of a destructive thing because there might come a point in the future where we're just holding panes of glass. Um, and that's not something I necessarily want. I want to know I've got a phone in my pocket. I want to know I've got a phone in my hand. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Tienis. That Well, the trend is definitely not going away. We know that. Um, every couple of months, we get an announcement from a, a smartphone company say, this is now the thinnest phone in the world, and it's all hype and all wonderful. But then very few of these devices are actually proper ones. Um, so that, uh, as you say, it's a, it's, a, it's a worry that phones become so thin that they can't pack, you know, the, the, the processing power in there. And more, more importantly, they have to fit a smaller and smaller battery. So I don't think the trend is going away, but I, I, I do hope that they sort out battery issues um, before it does become thinner. The, the newest issue, of course, is the fact that the camera nodule doesn't fit in properly. So we've got all these uh, phones with, with, with the camera sticking out, which I don't like at all. Um, you know, the biggest the biggest uh, examples is, of course, the iPhone and the Galaxy S6. And talking about the iPhone, um, the 6S just launched um, this week. But funnily enough, we've already seen rumors about the iPhone 7, which is coming out in, in 12 months' time. And uh, the, the first rumors are that it's going to be the thinnest phone that has ever been made and the thinnest iPhone. So, so I mean, it's not going anywhere. Um, I do hope, though, that we have great battery technology for, for when these thin phones are the norm. I don't really mind, you know, having a thin phone, but it still needs to have that heft to it. Um, as you say, I, I really need to know at all times where my phone is in my pockets, otherwise I'm paranoid. But um, the thinness doesn't, doesn't worry me. It's just, you know, those camera nodules sticking out, they get scratched. Um, so. Uh, it's that and the battery life. If they can figure that out, then, then I'm happy with a thin phone. Cobello Magi asks us, um, is laptop RAM more powerful than smartphone RAM? And is the 4 gigabytes of RAM found on the Galaxy Note 5 and the Galaxy S6 Edge Plus really necessary? Well, the reason we picked this question is, is it because it's actually quite a contentious issue because a lot of people have the misconception that more RAM equates better RAM. Um, so, for example, a lot of people think that if your phone has four gigs of RAM on it, it's just as powerful as your laptop or PC that has four gigs of RAM on it. And that's, that's of course, not true. Um, the, the architecture of the two types of RAM are completely different. Um, and, and the speed at which they run is also completely different. Obviously, I mean, that's why PCs have, like, RAM slots and they've got these big, you know, RAM chips. Um, so si size is, is a big reason why RAM in, in smartphones isn't nearly as quick as it is, um, as it is in smartphones. Oh, on the other side of the of the question, um, regarding the Note 5 and the S6 Edge Plus, well, I would never not take more RAM in my phone. I mean, if I think it's a, it's a good thing. Um, whether it's necessary or not, it would definitely depend solely on the software. And I think in Samsung's case, it's definitely necessary. You know, the touch whiz on a Samsung device, uh, I'm sorry to say, is still not good enough um, in my books. Um, I really don't like the software, and I think it, it, it really requires a lot more RAM to run properly than some other smartphones. The other thing, of course, is that Android devices do need more RAM. Um, so the Android software is probably not as uh, it's probably not as friendly on hardware as some other OSs like Windows Phone and iOS. So that is a reason why you'll always find Android devices with more RAM, um, or you should um, usually see that. Then the reason for that is um, because Android wasn't built. Um, to be, you know, this slim, sleek operating system that works on a couple of phones. It was built so that anybody can use it. So it's, it's, that's why it's, it's, it's got a much broader um, feature or it's got a much broader appetite for hardware. Um, and that's why they needed to build in, um, you know, a lot of capabilities in terms of usability. 
so that anybody can pick up the software and basically use it. That's all for this episode of Bandwidth Blog on Air. Thank you very much for listening and thank you very much for sending us your questions. Um, if we didn't happen to cover your question this time, stay tuned to the next episode of Bandwidth Blog on Air where we'll be picking up and doing a part two of our listeners' mail. Thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next week for episode 10 of Bandwidth Blog on Air. You've been listening to Bandwidth Blog on Air, the weekly podcast of bandwidthblog.com.